right. I'm Ben. I'm Jen. This is Philosophy Friday. Uh, so since the other uh, three days a week, uh, when GTAA is on uh, is on YouTube, it's uh, more or less all politics all the time. And it's, it's uh, you know the movie stuff. But uh, so uh, take a little break and and do some uh, not overtly political. Uh, or not at all political. Sure, I'm just trying to, you know, throw a bone <laughs> to the people who are like, oh, no politics, what do you mean? Everything is, yeah, okay, whatever, you know. <laughs> um, but, uh, this so, is better, we promise. Some uh, philosophy content uh, for uh, for Fridays. Um, and uh, today, uh, we thought we would do a little bit of... Uh, probability so one way of Woo, math <laughs> shout out kathy all right now you're gonna make me believe you know, <laughs> oh uh, sorry <laughs> yeah i mean one, one way to think about this cool puzzles yes the puzzle day yes cool puzzles that is that is the correct friend uh, <laughs> so uh, so one way to uh to think about this is that Oftentimes, what you think of when you think of logic uh, is deductive logic. So, uh, deductive logic is you know you got okay. Here's my premise. Here's my premise. Therefore, this conclusion. And what you're going for is if the pre you know if the premises are true, then uh, that guarantees that the uh, that uh, that the conclusion <laughs> is true. Uh, so well, you did it to me once, so I guess it's only fair. <laughs> um, you did it to him, you mean? He did it to me, I did it to him, whatever. Okay, so <laughs> same thing, just opposite. Yeah, uh, <laughs> so yeah, the bookshelf needs work. I keep saying that the bookshelf needs some work. Well, in any case, uh, so obviously. That's the best scenario. If you think about like stock examples of uh, valid deductive arguments, uh, all men are mortal. Socrates is a man, therefore. Socrates is mortal. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and think about. No, Ben does not need any more books. He just needs to arrange them in a nicer fashion. Fair enough. So uh, if you think about uh, if you think about that argument. Like what makes that such a good kind of argument is that if it's true that all men are mortal and it's true that Socrates is a man. Then the conclusion that Socrates is mortal is inescapable. Right. And that's what we love. Right. Inescapable. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Gotta hate escape. So uh, so that would be, so that's the ideal situation is what you have there. So it's a valid, which is what deductive logic is. It's the branch of logic where you're looking at arguments to see whether or not they're valid. And valid means if the premises are true, the conclusion must be true. Are you sure you're not scaring people off with this, Ben? Oh. <laughs> so. I hope their eyes don't look like the eyes of my logic students on the first day. <laughs> well, anyway. Uh, so, uh, so that's the ideal scenario. Uh, and especially that kind of valid deductive argument is really ideal because you know it can be pretty sure that um that socrates is a man uh I suppose it's just barely possible that he's like a shape-shifting alien or something but you know is it though <laughs> yeah, it's not a can't rule out a hundred percent you know 99.9999999 uh and um uh, but you know Realistically, we can be sure that Socrates is a man, and we can be sure that all men are mortal. So we can therefore be uh, be sure uh, that uh, that Socrates uh, is uh, is is mortal, and so that's the ideal scenario that uh, you're sure that the premises are true, and it's a valid argument. So if you're sure the premises are true, you can be sure the conclusion is true. And that's like the best way that you could possibly hope to reason about anything. But sadly, uh, reality is often not nearly as cooperative as that. And it does not 
with most things that we're interested in reasoning about most of the time, it does not furnish us with uh, so much information that we can go straight from things that we can be rock solid, sure or true, uh, that to conclusions that are deductively entailed by those things. So we have to muck around with probability. Uh, and one thing about uh, probability is that I think much more so than deductive logic, uh, where like when somebody explains to you, okay, if, if either A or B is true and A is not true, therefore B is true, like even if you're hearing it for the first time, you kind of nod along. That, that sounds right. Uh, and there are a few things here and there. Either in understanding or in confusion. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, you know, one hopes and under with one others. hopes. Um. So, whereas even the people who are not along with with understanding rather than confusion to that stuff, when you get to probability, it often has a way of screwing with your intuitions. So, uh. Uh, wants to, you know, someone is totally ignorant of philosophy and wants to start learning. Any thoughts about that? What they should read? An intro book. <laughs> okay. I <fine>. mean. <laughs> do, you, do you have a particular, particular <laughs> intro book that you think is good? Um, no. Okay. Uh, I think of what you're interested <laughs> in is, is moral philosophy. Uh, I think there's a little collection of papers that's often used in intro ethics classes edited by James Rachels, of, I think in later editions by son Stuart Rachels. It's called The Right Thing to Do. Uh, I've always thought that was pretty good. Uh, if if you're interested in uh, in other kinds of, of philosophy, uh, oh, actually, so something that would be, it's like a very textbooky textbook. It's not like the first one I said, which is really just a you know, collection of essays. Um, but there's a book. Uh, there is no wrong day. <laughs> by uh, Schick and Vaughn. Uh, so Theodore Schick and Louis Vaughn uh, called um, Doing Philosophy, an Introduction Through Thought Experiments, which I, I, I think, you know, I'm not in love with absolutely everything about that book, but I think it's got a lot of <laughs> interesting, fun, vivid examples. I would say that SEP, that's good, but it's a little much for a beginner. Um, I would recommend Wikipedia. Yes. I say that to my students. They all laugh. <laughs> and uh, but, but I'm not joking. It really is. It's, it's the best place to look. You know, if you're interested in something like Socrates, type it in and then follow the links and you, yeah, do I mean, whatever. I mean, you I know, think, that, that really is the best place to, to start. Yeah, I think for getting like an absolute first pass, you've never heard of this before and you want to, you know, you want to get a sense of it. I think that's good. Yeah. Well, think, yeah, that's. Uh, the, uh, I think Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy is like a good like once you've sort of gotten that right like that's a good place to go for uh, for the deeper uh, deeper dives. Um, the really deep dives, though, I would I would start at Wikipedia and then just look elsewhere on the internet and then maybe go to the SCP. That's that's pretty deep diving. Yeah, uh, Alex says general surveys don't go diving into primary works. I think it depends what primary works we're talking about. Um, I, I think that there, I think that there are people don't who, go diving into Hegel or something, but like yeah, the sure. dialogues you could do that or yeah. So it's so just talk about uh, Plato's uh, dialogues uh, featuring Socrates. So uh, those are uh, those are things that you could definitely read, like without like a lot of background. You can dive into those. Uh, I think. Uh, I think Nietzsche and David Hume are both are both like important for historical philosophers who are actually easy to read. Um, but, uh, I mean, some people, you know, like Marx wrote things that are super easy to read and wrote things that are extremely not super easy to read. Or you can look at my class videos on YouTube. So you could do that. 
uh, are those uh, are those unlisted or are those just uh, oh yeah those are those are unlisted but you know I should just I should just make them all public yeah you should I should um so they're very entertaining um Ben is in them sometimes um stuffed Snoopy and Woodstock in them sometimes my stuffed bat he makes frequent appearances so you know Snoopy or not Snoopy Lucy and and Shabazz show up a lot so you know there's there's nothing to to not like Bertrand Russell uh poor philosopher super easy to read um, <laughs> I don't have any videos about Bertrand Russell you don't I don't okay you definitely saw his stuff in your classes that I've been in but okay it's been a long time uh but yeah Russell super easy to read um Judith Jarvis Thompson, uh, super easy to read, and and uh, uh, and and wrote lots of interesting stuff. You can read the obituary I wrote about her for Jacobin last You're year. You're always plugging your own stuff. I am. Yes. Uh, so, <laughs> um, so anyway, uh, those. So I, I think those were all primary sources that are good. But uh, but I, I also. I also think Jen's right. Don't like just just like start like trying to get yourself to like read Hegel or something right out the gate or um, ever really. I, well, so, I, why would you do that to yourself? And and another another thing going off of what somebody said, uh, a lot of YouTube videos are just excruciatingly boring. Not mine, but a lot of what are you are you saying otherwise? No, I just wondered if you had any other qualifications besides not yours. Oh, well, yeah, most of them other than mine are pretty boring. Yeah, I mean, sorry, <laughs> that's just the way Do you have is. anybody else you want to exempt that you can think of? Um, no. <laughs> Might be sitting I right mean, here. these. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Do you have a lot of philosophy videos out there? No. Uh, I, well, okay, then. That, that's what I was talking about, YouTube philosophy videos. Yeah. Uh, yeah, those those uh, those Rick Roderick uh, lectures are fun. I've, I've watched uh, I've watched some of those. So, all right. Um, yeah. Yeah. Do forget where. Oh. Uh, <laughs> and actually, also, I, I disagree. I'm not reading Hegel ever. But if you uh, but if you want to get uh, some sense <coughs> of what Hegel is saying uh, without starting out by reading Hegel. Uh, the first chapter of G.A. Cohen's book, uh, Karl Marx's Theory of History, is about Hegel's theory of history, and uh, and Cohen has like an almost magical talent for distilling all of that stuff that Hegel says into like clear arguments with labeled premises and stuff like that. So uh, that'd be my recommendation there. But before we got off on all this, we we're starting to talk about <laughs> probability and how a probabilistic reasoning. Uh, cases where you say where you're reasoning about okay if there's like some such and ch chance that this is true what's the chance that this is true uh, often tends to screw with our intuitions uh, much more than uh, than deductive uh, deductive reasoning so a, uh, a I think a pretty clear example of this uh, is um, is the well, actually, I guess before before we even do Monty Hall, uh, should you, do you want to do a, a quick rundown of like the gambler's fallacy? Yeah, you go to to Las Vegas and you see the roulette wheel coming up, red, 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 red. What are you gonna bet on? You're gonna bet on black. Why? Because you think that if it's come up red so many times, black is due, and that's what you should put your money on. And this is how people ended up losing millions of dollars in Monte Carlo when red. Or black. One of the two ended up coming up twenty six times in a row. Right. Uh, so that, so it's black is due. Black is due. Black is due. Uh, but guess what? There's no such thing as due. Yeah, the the roulette wheel doesn't remember the no. previous spins. <laughs> uh, it's uh, it's a random process, so it's exactly as likely every time. Uh, if you know, or maybe it's easier if if you just think of something simpler like a flipping a coin. Flipping a coin. Uh, so the coin does not think. Well, I just came up heads five times in a row. I guess I should come up tails. Yeah, time now. for tails. Right? <laughs> time for tails. It is exactly no. <laughs> fifty fifty every every time, single time. Uh, so uh, you know, it, like, and any, um, I think sometimes people 
get confused about this because like if you write it out of the board, you have some string like heads, 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 heads. I think I just listed off ten heads. I'm not sure, but anyway, assume I did. Uh, they uh, that like that sounds super unlikely. You think, come on, what are the chances there would be ten times in a row heads? So if it's come up heads nine times, they think, well, okay, uh, next time is probably going to be a tails. But the fact that it's it's come up heads nine times is totally irrelevant to the probability that it's going to come up uh, heads the tenth time. And of course, it's true if you if you calculate, okay, what's the probability you're going to get that exact stream, uh, that exact string heads 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 heads. Uh, it's, it's the probability of getting any other string of 10. Yeah, it's it's very unlikely, but no more unlikely than heads, 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 tails. The, <laughs> any string is is very unlikely. Yeah, literally any string of heads and heads and tails, even if it's something that looks totally normal to you, like heads, tails, tails, yeah, heads, like, tails, tails. Or tails, totally heads, alternating, tails. you know, that's not any more likely or unlikely than anything else. I don't know. Uh, and in fact, if you think about the gambler, uh, we at when we uh, were adjuncts at Rutgers, uh, we both taught a class called uh, Furdom. Uh, Furdom. <laughs> for, ah, Furdom. Uh, formal reasoning and decision making. So Furdom. Furdom. Uh, and uh, in the gambler's fallacy uh, PowerPoint, we we're uh, we we're both using for that. Uh, you know, the uh, the gambler uh, was uh, horses McDice. Mm -hmm. uh, is ben the, came up with that. Is the, uh, is the gambler who's uh, who's engaged, who's fallen prey to the gambler's fallacy, mm -hmm. and the uh, and if you think about what's wrong with horses McDice's reasoning, well, it's he would only be playing in the first place because he believes it's fair. He, you know, he yeah. he thinks that it's not rigged in any way. Sure. Uh, why and, would you play at a rigged roulette wheel? And in fact, that's why he thinks well. Uh, it's it's not just going to be you know heads for you know I mean whatever it's not just going to be red forever it's going to be black at some point, um, and that because he thinks it's fair because he knows that there's a equal chance, uh, and but then he's like forgetting it later on because because uh, he's saying uh, that. Um, that there's that the fact that it's come up, you know, that's come up red so many times means it's more likely to come up black. But if each time it's random, it's not rigged in any way. This the system has no memory of the previous spins. Uh, then that that doesn't make sense. So that one's like I think sometimes in practice people are like very prone to this. Well, uh, we as humans are very bad at randomness. We don't understand what randomness really looks like. We think it alternates a lot more than it really does. You know, you ask students to write out a string of what they think a random hundred coin flips would look like, and it, it you hardly ever get the kind of strings that you would get in an actual hundred coin flip. Yeah, like like it, like if if like in a fertile class, you ask people to you know, the class full of people to do this. And then you say, okay, raise your hand. If you've got a string of at least five heads in a row, six heads in a row, seven heads in a row. And by the time you get to like eight or nine, it's like nobody, but like actually the likelihood of having at least one string like that in the whole thing is very high, is very high. Uh, so I might be wrong, but I, I think I remember having a, a string of like eight. There's 77%. So it's it's very whatever it is it's very high. Yeah. Well, and uh, we but we don't understand. Yeah. Yeah, that is the Monty Hall problem. Yeah. We're going to get to that. Uh, but yeah, but people don't understand what randomness looks like. And something else, if I remember correctly, iTunes had to change their their random shuffle because it wasn't people didn't it didn't feel random. Because once you play a song and you throw it back in, then you can pick any song. You know, it, it, it can be any song next. It can even be that same song again. Or it could be the next song on the album. Or but if, you know, but it, but it if, could be anything. But people didn't think that that felt random. So iTunes had to make it less random so that it would feel to the consumer more random. Yeah, and, and that's the kind. Yeah, that's the uh, so that's like a small demonstration of uh, how much trouble uh, human brains tend to have uh, with uh, with randomness. 
uh, in general, uh, and uh, and or you know with with thinking about uh, probability. Uh, and uh, and yes, I, I hear you clamoring, you know, for the Monty Hall problem in the back of the lecture hall. We will get to the Monty Hall problem. We're gonna get those minds wrapped around it. Yes, absolutely. I thought we would be at it uh, much sooner than this, but yeah. <laughs> you know how Ben likes to go on about things. <laughs> Scenic tour. <laughs> uh, well, I was just so. Uh, and we will not be explaining this in a political fashion. <laughs> uh, yeah. So another, like a, a different sort of way. But you know, even though I think in practice we're super prone to gambler's fallacy or hot hands fallacy, which is just gambler's fallacy, but the other way around. You yeah, think, beginner's luck. You think like if you have beginner's luck, you think that what's happening is going to continue to happen. But then the gambler's fallacy, you think what's going to happen is not going to continue to happen. And yet we tend to believe in both of these things. Right. Um, so yeah, hot hands is where you think like, oh, it's been heads nine times in a row. Heads is on a roll. You know, I, <laughs> I should bet on heads for next time. Exactly. Um, so these are things that we're super prone to in practice, but when you hear it explained in the abstract, it's like pretty easy to get what's wrong with it. It's like, okay, that makes sense. I, I, I see why that's silly to think that the past outcomes change the probability of uh, future outcomes. Uh, but there are- But that's very system two thinking. And we're very run by system one. Okay, I don't think most people probably do. I think that. most people do. And if they don't, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> that's too much of a detour. <laughs> I mean, if you, that just seems like something you can't bring up without explaining. I mean, system one is what runs us most of the time. It's basically, it's our instinct, our gut feeling, our when we see one plus one, we don't have to sit and think about it. You know, easy math is system one, harder math is system two. Yeah. System two takes more effort and brain power and our brains are lazy. And so they rely on system one most of the time. Yeah, this is the Daniel Kahneman thinking fast and slow. Um, I think it's been very popularized. I think it has been very popularized, but I also think there are a lot of people who've never heard of it. Um, so I, I don't think you can assume people have. But um, but yeah. So uh, so I think that. But then, like you think, uh, there are you know certainly when we get to the Monty Hall problem, like that's something that it's not the case that as soon as there's been a little bit of explanation, you're like, Oh, okay. Now I get it. Right. You know, it's, it's super <laughs> counterintuitive or, or even like a, uh, another example uh, that is uh, popular to think by that, uh, that same guy, Kahneman and his uh, frequent collaborator, uh, Amos. Amos. Yes. Amos. Yes. I, in the, in the first book, uh, give them an argument. I, I, Called him Aaron, but yes, Amos. Oh, sorry. Amos is his name. If there's ever, Amos Tversky. Is, if there's ever a second edition, I'm going to correct. Uh, that would be nice. Uh, you know, the poor, <laughs> well, he's dead. He doesn't the care. Correlate to Professor Tversky's uh, name. Um, but uh, Kahneman Tversky uh, popularized uh, another example that I think I think demonstrates uh, how much trouble that we have thinking about probability. Uh, which which do you want to run through real quick before the Monty Hall because it's just because it's a fun example. Yeah, I didn't even realize we were doing this until I saw the link. <laughs> <laughs> uh, which is uh, the Linda the feminist bank teller example. So this is uh, they they gave people the survey where they described this this fictional character uh, Linda and they said all this stuff about her. Here's the background information about Linda. Um, she was a philosophy major in college. Uh, she is, has always been very dependent. She was, she participated, marched in anti-nuclear demonstrations. And there are a few more things like that. And now given this background information, which of these two is more likely? One. That Linda is a bank teller. Two. That Linda is a feminist bank teller. And. So what is your answer? Which one is more likely? Bank teller, feminist bank teller. Think about that. All right, your time's up. <laughs> and if you're like most people, uh, your your first instinct is to say feminist bank teller uh, is is more likely. Uh, Why? Because it fits in with the things that you know about Linda. Okay. <laughs> sorry, I went, that was badly said. Uh, so. Uh, yeah, that's, you know, because it fits in with all the things you know, that sounds more likely. 
but it can't uh, be more likely. No. Because if whatever the probability is that Linda is a bank teller is made up, like if you think about it, at least the metaphor that always works for me, this is cheesy, but is uh, thinking. I like it when you get all cheesy. <laughs> of uh, probability, a probability as like a slice of the pie of possibility. Uh, so the pie of possibility. I know the pie of possibility. That's right. That's right. <laughs> uh, so, and and if you think about the slice of the pie of possibility, that is uh, that is all the possibilities <laughs> where where Linda is a bank teller. Mm-hmm. That includes both possibilities where she's a bank teller and a feminist. And also possibilities where she's a bank teller and not a feminist. So like a Venn diagram, you have the circle where Linda is a bank teller and the feminist bank teller will be inside of the bank teller and therefore small. Yeah. And so, right. You, that feminist bank teller slice is something you'd have to slice out of the, uh, the bank teller slice. (laughs) And maybe that's like the overwhelming majority of the bank teller slice, right? Maybe that like, given her being a bank teller, there's a 99.9% probability that she's a feminist bank teller. Even so, the probability that she's a bank teller still has to be bigger than the probability that she's a feminist bank teller because the probability that she's a bank teller includes the probability that she's a feminist bank teller, but also the probability, no matter how tiny, that she's a non-feminist bank teller. So there you go. All right. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, uh, <laughs> in any case, uh, yeah, who knows what's happened to Linda since college? You know, she she could She's have a bank un- teller. She could have undergone a change of heart. Uh, and and again, it's it it might be much more likely that she you know like. It could be that like there's only like a one percent chance that she's a bank teller because she could be having all these different jobs. And it could be that there's like a 90% chance that she's a feminist, but still the chance that she's both of those things at the same time still has to be smaller than the chance that, uh, that she is uh, just, a, uh, just a bank teller. Yeah. And this, again, this is an example of system one, because we hear these characteristics of Linda and then bank teller. Well, nothing about these characteristics says bank teller. But feminist bank teller, that matches up. And so we're like, oh, that matches with that. Okay. And that's our system one. Because you have to bring in system two to start thinking about, well, the probabilities and the Venn diagrams and the, what is it, the pie of possibilities. Yeah, yeah. You know, this is all system two. And we, we don't like to bust out system two when we don't think it's necessary. Yeah, that you just sort of run on reasoning autopilot. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's a good autopilot. And it less, But then... And that's what gives you, oh, feminist bank teller, that sounds more likely. Uh, but then you have to actually stop and slow down and think about it. And the uh, reason I like this example is we go, okay, gambler's fallacy, some mistake we're very prone to make, but the second you hear why it doesn't make sense, like, oh, yeah, right. Um, feminist bank teller, uh, mistake we're very prone to make, and it takes like a minute, but like at the end of that minute, it's like, oh, okay. Yeah, right. okay. You know, I got you. I mean, once you hear about the pie of <laughs> pie of possibility, <laughs> come on! I mean, I, I made it folksy. There was pie. There was pie. <laughs> I don't know. That's surely that's that that makes it clear. Uh, all you need is pie. All you need is pie. Uh, so then, uh, but then when you think about the Monty Hall problem, uh, we're not trying to make it topical. Uh, <laughs> Actually, it's try not what we do here. Actually, <laughs> trying to not make it topical. This is the uh, uh, even a lot of the new movie discussions get topical, but uh, but Philosophy Friday is our one day of being non-topical. Uh, so uh, so so this is intentionally untopical. Uh, change it up a is little. Is it untopical or non-topical? Intopical. 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 Detopical. <laughs> Uh, oh, so are we going to do one of these? Sounds, sounds topicality. Oh, boy. Uh, so, yeah. So let's do... Um, the Monty Hall problem? The Monty Hall problem. You want to start us off with the Monty Hall problem? Um, sure. So you are a contestant on a game show. There are three doors in front of you. Behind two of them are goats, and behind one of them is a car. Now, you have to to go with the idea that what you would prefer is the car. 
even though most of us, I think, would prefer goats, especially if we do yoga, uh, we need our goats for that. But for this example, you, you have to go with the idea that you would prefer the car. So the, uh, the game show host says, okay, Jen, pick a door and we'll open it and show you what's behind it. So if you, if, so let's say you pick door A, he opens it up, cars behind it, that's that, okay. You pick door A, he opens it up, and there's a goat behind it. And then he says, okay, I'm gonna help you out. I'm gonna open one of these other two doors, B or C, and show you what's behind that. So he opens door B, and there's a goat. So you have your original choice, door A, and then you have the other door, the unopened door, door C. You have two options now. The, uh, the, <laughs> the, the uh, I was gonna say the bank teller. The game show host tells you, you can stick with your original door or you can switch to door C. What are you gonna do? And the thing that feels obvious, in fact, you know, it, in fact, you think, all right, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go all system two here and think about it. And the thing that still feels obvious is, well, it doesn't matter because it's fifty fifty, right? Yeah, right. it's either we've taken door B out of things, so it's either door A or door C, and that's two, and that's fifty fifty. So, might as well stick with what I got. Yeah, uh, like think, and yeah, if you think. Like sometimes I'll ask, like give this to students and uh, and have them like pass up a little piece of paper with which one they pick and you know which one they do, and and then I'll ask you know tally it up and then I'll ask people why they picked the one they picked and the people who say stick, you know stick to A, uh, it's always because uh, like they never actually think that makes it more likely that you'll get the car. What they think is like. It's equally likely, and I'd feel really silly if you know if if I was wrong, you know. Yeah, that's the status quo bias. You know, we we stick with we pick one, and then if we think it doesn't matter, why would we switch? Right, that's very true. <laughs> uh, so, but like, what they really think, like when you pin them down, is it doesn't matter. Yeah, you know, that's it's totally indifferent. You know, stick switch, you have an equally good chance of getting it either way. Yeah. Uh, and that feels very obvious. And if that's your strong reaction to it, you are Not in alone. excellent company. Uh, there are <laughs> there are lots of, um, like there are famous mathematicians who uh, who will tell you that they when they first heard this, they were sure that that was the right answer. Also, it was on Mythbusters. There you go. <laughs> um, one, they you know looked at two myths about it and, and the one, the first one, was that most people would choose to stick, and that is actually what happened. Yeah. Confirmed. Um, yeah. And, and like, uh, Paul Erdos, for example, uh, was this uh, famous, crazy Hungarian mathematician who uh, would, uh, would go around, would, like, <laughs> co-wrote papers with many, many people. So to this day, it's, a, it's like a weird, like, status thing for mathematicians and logicians. I've heard about this over dinner, like, 25 times. <laughs> they have a, uh, Erdos, <laughs> hey, Kathy, again. <laughs> uh, an Erdosh number. So an Erdosh number is, uh, like, if you co-wrote a paper with somebody who co-wrote a paper with Erdosh, uh, then you have an Erdosh number of two. If you, it's like Kevin Bacon. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's like degrees of Kevin Bacon. So, um, uh, which, yeah, whatever. I mean, like, I, I, it's, this is, this is hopelessly lame, but you know, I, I, I was a little excited when I got mine, you know, right. That they have, I've, I've got <laughs> Irash number five because I co-wrote a paper with Otavio Bueno who co-wrote a paper. Oh somebody, boy. A paper with somebody, <laughs> oh, you can't list out the people. Uh, let's see. Beziao uh, is one of the, Tarski is one of, Tarski is the one who actually co-wrote a paper with, with Erdash. Um, and Beziao is one, and there's one link that I'm forgetting. But anyway, I'm very disappointed in you. Uh, so, isn't uh, this on your Facebook bio? It is, yes. So, all right, <laughs> it's not on mine. <laughs> mine is zero. Um, so this is uh, point is Erdash uh, is is this big deal mathematician 
Uh, and he and you know he said yeah when, when when he first heard this he was certain that the uh, that sticking that it didn't system one that it didn't matter that you know that, that like that uh, and you know I think a lot of people when they first hear about this uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, <laughs> yeah when they first hear about this. They'll like really argue about it for a long time. In fact, uh, I heard, you know, when I posted this on Twitter that we we're going to do this, this topic today, um, somebody told me the Monty Hall problem was actually trending because there's some like, was it computer? Because of us? No. Because uh, there's on. some computer scientist is like a data breach expert or something. So, you know, like has a blue check mark, but he was, uh, uh, but he, but he was like posting up a storm because he was like angry about like everybody saying that this is the wrong answer, but it is, damn it, you know. Uh, but it is not. <laughs> so, People get worked up over the strangest things. Yeah. Um, so, uh, so people. So it just seems obvious that uh, that it doesn't matter that it's fifty fifty. Two doors, fifty fifty. Yeah. Uh, but actually there is a two thirds probability that you will get the, uh, that you're going to get the car by switching. You are better off to switch. How does this work, Ben? Uh, so one way, so the way, the way that it works is to think, okay, um, uh, knowing that this is the format of the show. That this is the way this is the way it works. That it's that there are two rounds. In the first round, you have to guess, and in the second round, you have a choice between um, sticking with your guess and switching after a door has been opened. And the other thing is that the the host is never going to open the door with the car. That's he knows I'm... where the car is, and he's never going to show you the car because what would be the point of that? Yeah. He is always going to show you a goat. That is exactly what I was going to say. Yeah. So uh, that, like, because you know this is the format, there are two things that have to be true of the door uh, that the uh, that Monty opens. Uh, one of them is that it has to have a goat behind it because if it's a car behind it, it's the one you picked. The game's over and you won. If it has a car behind it, it's not the one you picked. <laughs> game's over and you lost. Either way, there can't be a second round. So it has to have a goat behind it, mm -hmm. and it can't be the one you picked because it was the one you picked. And it had a car, game's over and you won. If it's the one you picked and it had to have a goat, game's over and you lost. Uh, so uh, so it has to be not the one you picked, and it has to uh, have um, and it has to uh, have a goat have a goat. Uh, and so no like knowing this, once you've got that sorted out, there's like a much longer version of this uh, that you can do with like Bayes' theorem to show how. Which we are not doing. We are absolutely <laughs> not going to try to do that for a boy. We're not going to watch that little number tick down to zero <laughs> while we do Bayes' theorem. <laughs> yeah. But uh, a, a sort of basic, like somewhat more intuitive, or at least like you don't have to watch like numbers being written down way of thinking about it is. Knowing what you know about the format, well, if you uh, the question is if you switch, right? Like if you got it wrong the first time, if your initial guess was wrong, what's the what's the probability that you're going to get the car by switching? Oh, are you asking me? Yeah. Uh sixty six percent. No. What? Uh, I think I misunderstood. Yeah, the question. yeah, you're you're answering a different question. <laughs> oh, it was the uh, it was the right answer to uh, to a different question. Oh. But, uh, the uh, the question is, <laughs> if you got it wrong the first time, right? If I got it wrong the first time, what are the pro What's the probability that you'll get the car by switching? I I'm still confused. Hundred percent, right? Oh, right. Yeah. 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 If you got it right, if you got it wrong the first time, if your initial answer was a door. If the car is behind C and you switch to C, then yes, 100% that you'll. Yeah. So, you know, and it, without even knowing which door he opened up in between, which is the remaining door, just like knowing the format of the show, mm -hmm. uh, if you if if you were wrong the first time, the chance that you'll get the car by switching is 100%. So, uh, so if uh 
So, or a different way to say that is if you were wrong the first time, you will get the car by switching. So, next question. What's the chance that you're wrong the first time? Oh, are you asking me? <laughs> yeah, I thought we were uh, a little 66%. rhythm here. We go, you know? <laughs> so, yeah, 66%. Right? There's, there's, a, there's a two-thirds chance that you're wrong the first time because there are three possibilities. You picked one. There's a two-thirds chance that you're wrong. So if you are wrong, you will get the car by switching 100%. And there's a 66 chance percent chance that you're wrong. So there's a 66 percent chance that you'll get the car by switching. This is a really different way of explaining it. Okay, it's the one I've I, it's the one I've always used. But really, they, yeah, huh? Many years. So okay. they, uh, so uh, this is so if you grant that there's a two thirds chance you're wrong the first time, you grant that you will get the car if you uh, if you switch. That if you were wrong, you will get the car if you switch. Then there's a two-thirds chance that you get the car if uh, uh, if you switch. And one um, way, thank you, Joshua. Uh, so, uh, thank so, Joshua. <laughs> so, uh, so, oftentimes I know, like, just given that explanation, it's not going to be enough to be like, okay, I get it now, right? Like uh, that you might still have that strong sense of intuitive longness. Uh, and I think one way that might be helpful is to like sort of try to reduce that sense of intuitive wrongness, at least if you can't get rid of it entirely is to switch it up. Uh, so think uh, like revise the, the example. Imagine that instead of uh, three doors where one of them had a car and two of them had goats, imagine a hundred doors, imagine a thousand doors or 999 have goats behind them and one has a car same deal uh so this time so you 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 have to pick one right you say door number 37 whatever you know you pick one uh that you know for your initial guess in between monty opens 998 doors it's a lot of doors there's a lot of doors he's, he's gonna Poor be very, monty. Isn't very he old he's gonna be very <laughs> tired by the time he's open well he's dead now <laughs> but at this time i think he was very old <laughs> exactly so uh <laughs> But Monty or his assistants, or maybe he has buttons that compressed open them, uh, as, as open, you know, there's, there's. Maybe he had girls like in, um, uh, what is that, the deal, deal uh -huh. thing? I know what you're talking about. Let's make a deal? Yeah. Or, is that uh, what it was? Uh, yeah. So. Dude, help. Y'all, help <laughs> us. What was that? <laughs> Let's make a deal with all the pretty girls and the cases and. Right, so all that stuff. Right, he's, he's got nine hundred ninety-eight of them. You know, <laughs> open up different doors. Uh, so uh, yeah, uh, she's not talking about Wheel of Fortune, but Wheel of Fortune has the same. You know, there's, there's just <laughs> one in that case, right, Savannah? The one uh, with the uh, with the bald dude who's a germaphobe, and uh, yeah, they're all the pretty girls, and they all have briefcases, and they open them up, and then they call you, and they say, uh, "Will will you accept this deal?" And deal or no deal? Thank you. Thank yeah. you. So, uh, <laughs> so the, the bald dude with the germaphobe. So the uh, so so the deal or no deal girls have opened up nine hundred ninety eight doors, and in this case, I think it might be a little bit more intuitive for some people. That's like okay. Is it really 50-50 that the random door you first picked or the only one that's left out of the thousand doors uh, is equally likely to have the car behind it? Or uh, does this, um, uh, uh, or, uh, or is it more likely? That you'll get the uh, that you get the money by switching. In this case, overwhelmingly more likely that you know that there's a ninety nine point nine percent chance that you'll that you'll get the uh, that you get the money by switching. Yeah, because no matter how many how many doors there are, the the one that you pick, you know, they're they're all equal. Like in the three doors, they each have a third percent chance. The one that you pick is a third percent chance, and now it's two thirds percent over here so you got well, now one third versus two thirds we've knocked out part of the of the two thirds so why wouldn't you switch over to the two thirds okay i mean that to me is how i've always explained explained it. it yeah like once you've chosen it's one third versus two thirds so obviously you want a two thirds chance instead of a one third chance fair enough 
so all then um, all of this, at least, you know, sort of going from gambler's fallacy and hot hands fallacy and all that to Linda the feminist bank teller to the Monty Hall problem, sort of working our way from stuff that's like, oh yeah, okay, I get it now to, yeah, okay, I get it now to, wait, no, that can't be right. Uh, <laughs> but at least in all of these cases, uh, the you know there's a determinate uh, you know right answer, right? You know, you, you, you want to know what the right answer is. You just ask a math teacher and they tell you, or you know, preferably they like they, Kathy. they, uh, they show you how to work it out, you know, but uh, <laughs> you don't just have to trust them. But like basically, they can tell you what the right Kathy would never tell us the wrong answer. I trust Kathy <laughs> to tell us the right answer. You but, clearly don't, I do. No, I, 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 do. I totally do. I, I she, <laughs> She could tell me all kinds of wacky things. I just say, "Oh, yeah, okay. <laughs> you know." But, uh, in any case, um, so whereas the next thing we're going to talk about is something that's not like that. That it's it's not like oh, you just ask a math teacher and they tell you what the right answer is. Uh, it's something. I think all things are like that. <laughs> Well, in this case, the problem is it depends which one you ask, and they'll give you different answers uh, because different people. Uh, come down strongly on different sides of it. It's, uh, so this is uh, Newcomb's puzzle, or sometimes called Newcomb's paradox. Oh wait, wait, wait! I, I did. I, there was something I wanted to say sure. about um, the Monty Hall problem. Yeah, go for it. Is that when you <clears throat> when you don't tell people what's going on, and you um... <laughs> Kathy says they we gave a, a nice description. Of okay, so I feel I feel good about that though. Um. So when you give people the Monty Hall problem and, and they do it over and over and over uh, and you give the problem to pigeons and they do it over and over, the pigeons will catch on before human beings will catch on. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Did you see that? Yeah. That thing, by the way, going around uh, with the, the study comparing men and women's answers when asked like which of like these kinds of animals they thought they would be able to beat in a hand-to-hand uh, -hand fight. What? Okay, first of all, animals don't have hands. So. Fair enough. But, you know. I think we a, would beat any animal since they don't have hands. You know, Is that a, the right answer? So it goes through. Um, I think that two of the ones that male respondents were more likely to say that they'd be able to beat than female respondents were a goose. And, oh, no, you can't beat a goose. <laughs> Duh. You cannot beat a goose. Yeah. Um, you need an umbrella and a mathematician when you encounter a goose. Yeah, that's what we found. So no, I'm not joking about that. Um, <laughs> I, anyway, the best response I saw was from uh, Ilhan Omar, who, uh, who, who quote tweeted the thing and said, uh, I could easily defeat any of these, uh, but I would prefer to live in peace with all animals. <laughs> so, uh, you know, like the uh, like the energy of that, but uh, so is this like yes? That's what the, about pigeons? I, I don't think are we? I don't remember defeating I don't pigeons, pigeons in hand to wing combat. I don't think pigeons were there, but I do remember that detail. The eight percent of Americans <laughs> think they could beat an elephant in a fight. <laughs> Who are these people? Like the Rock? Who are these people? Hopefully, it's not you know like the U's and knees of the world. <laughs> yeah, I don't think I could beat an elephant in a fight. <laughs> I think it would step on me and I would lose. <laughs> but, oh, uh, boy. Yeah. Anyway. I think Tom Brady could because Tom Brady can do anything. Uh, no, okay. <laughs> and you know who else? Tom Cruise. All the Toms of the world. Yeah, I think Tom Cruise would. Uh, I don't. I don't know that Tom Cruise would beat the pigeon, but no, Tom. Tom. Tom Cruise would beat anybody yeah I don't, or anything I don't think that's all true i don't think he's that physically powerful <laughs> uh but uh in any case uh my mom's watching this going thor thor well i mean are, are we talking about the actor who plays thor or thor the, one. the the norse god because sure one. i believe that the norse god would be an elephant in a fight i don't believe that chris hemsworth would be an elephant in a fight uh <laughs> Yeah, even newborn elephants are bigger than you think they are. Um, yeah, but, uh, but in any case, uh, so Newcomb's Paradox. Uh, right, <laughs> right. So am I explaining this or are you explaining um, this? Go for it. So you have two boxes. One is clear and one is opaque. Uh, in the clear box, 
there to step in if I, you know, I haven't explained this out loud and probably forever. So in the clear box, there's a thousand dollars. You can see clearly in the clear box that there are a thousand dollars in the box. <laughs> um, and uh, you are going to, or the box, box B is, uh, it is opaque. You cannot see what is in box B. So what you are going to do is you are going to pick, uh, your goal is to get as much money as you can. And uh, your goal, yeah, is to get as much money as you can. And your procedure is you're either going to take, <laughs> you're either going to take both boxes or you are only going to take box B, which is the opaque box. Yeah, do, now, do, do, do I already say how much money was in each? I said there's $1,000 in the clear box and you don't know what's in the the opaque box. So it's either a million or nothing, is that it? I didn't say that yet, but yes, it's either oh, yeah. a million or nothing. I was getting to I was getting to that, thank you. So there's a, a predictor who's going to predict what you will do. I always, I always think of the predictor as uh, Dr. Manhattan from Watchmen uh, that, you know, since so you know, like he he has these amazing prediction abilities. Uh, he's not quite omniscient, right? Crucially, not quite. He could be wrong, uh, but is like a, his predictions are like ninety nine point nine percent accurate. Okay, so you have a um, a what a predictor? <laughs> there you go. So you have your predictor, and they're going to predict almost entirely accurately. Uh, what you are going to do. And if they predict that you will take box A and B, then they put no money in box B. If they predict that you will take box B, then they only, only box B, uh, then they will put a million dollars in box B. Okay, crucially... The predictor predicts before you choose. Yeah, so I, I think... That's why it's a prediction. Right. Happens beforehand. Uh, so I... I think that the way I'd always heard it was very slightly different, which was just the, the only respect in which was different is it's, is it's not that the, uh, that the money is put in uh, like because of the prediction. Uh, I don't know if this makes a big difference or not. Right. But the way, the way I always heard it was uh, that, you know, the money is in, right. You know, but was it the predictor? Maybe it is the way you said, because the way I remembered it was like the predictor just predicts, uh, that if uh, that uh, yeah, the predictor predicts, and then based on what they predict you're going to do, that's the money that they put in. Okay, so the way I heard it was just that the predictor, uh, the predictor predicts that if you uh, that if uh, that if you pick uh, just box B, the money will be in box B, uh, and the predictor predicts uh, that if you pick both boxes. Uh, the uh, then uh, the money's not going to be in box B. I don't know if that makes a difference or not. Yeah, because that kind of makes it sound like the predictor is predicting whether the money will be there. But the predictor knows because they put the money there. Yeah, so I... All I, the predictor's predicting is what you will do. Okay, well, maybe this changes how I feel about it because I, I thought it was that the, uh, the predictor is predicting whether the money will be there. The predictor is predicting that if you pick just box B, it'll have a million dollars in it. The predictor is predicting that if you pick both, uh, then uh, then box B won't have a million dollars in it. Regardless. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, this this problem, uh, this is uh, new Newcomb's comb. paradox. So N-E-W and then comb, right? New, new comb. and then comb. Yes. N-E-W, whatever that spells. Uh, <laughs> so yeah. Yeah. Newcomb, like new comb. No, you cannot pick just A. Yeah, you can either. Well, pick... there'd be no point to picking just A because you know that you're getting the thousand dollars, and there's just no possibility whatsoever that you'll get the million. So why would you do that? Well, you know, some people are like, "Well, I want the guarantee." Blah blah. Whatever. You cannot pick A. Well, you get the guarantee if you pick both. If you pick both, you are absolutely guaranteed the thousand from box A because box A is clear. You can pick both, or you can pick B. Right. That is what you can do. Right. So. What should you do? Should you pick both or should you pick box B only? And one way to, uh, to think about this uh, is that, and uh, that there are two competing uh, principles about good reasoning uh, that are at stake here. 
that like come into conflict in this case. Uh, that one of them is that if there is a 99.9% chance that you'll get a better outcome by doing it, then it's like the most rational thing is to do that thing. That, you know, that if, if there's, if what you want, you know, there's a 99 point, you know, 9% chance or whatever the threshold is, right? If there's an overwhelmingly high probability, you'll get what you want by doing a thing, you should do that thing. Uh, that seems like a, you know, that seems like a pretty plausible principle. Uh, but another uh, extremely plausible principle is that if you know that it's impossible that uh, that you'll get less money, be, you, that you'll get a worse outcome because of doing the thing. And so if you do a thing and that creates a possibility you'll get a better outcome and there's no possibility that you'll get a worse outcome, then you should do that thing. So uh, what you have here is a conflict between the rational thing to do and the best bet. Yeah, that's a good way of putting it. So like the, the clear sense in which the two box uh, solution in Newcomb's paradox, you know, you should pick both box A and box B is more rational is that on all possibilities, you'll get more money that way. If there is money in box B, you'll get more money by picking both than just box B because uh, you'll have, uh, because if you only pick box B, you'd only get the million. And uh, if you pick both, you'll get a million one thousand. Uh, and if there isn't any money in box B, then you'll get a thousand rather than nothing uh, by picking both. So there are two possibilities. There's so two either way, um, by taking both, you're upping by a thousand dollars. Yeah, you're getting a better outcome either way, right? There are two things that might be true. No matter which one is true, you'll get a thousand dollars extra mm -hmm. by by doing this. And and crucially, there's no. Uh, however, the predictor does it. Uh, like the, I think a really important detail is there's no backward causation. It's not like uh, somehow. It's not like somehow you're picking it retroactively causes him uh, causes them to put the money, you know, in box B or not put it there. Uh, that like that's going to have no impact. It, the money is there. It has nothing to do with what you decide later. So there's like this really like rock solid case that you can make. The most rational thing to do is to uh, is to pick both. But if you do that, there's a 99.9% .9 chance that you're not going to get the million. Yeah. So your best bet is to take box B, which uh, gets you the million dollars. Yeah. And, and I mean, you could even think of that as like, I mean, I like the way you said best bet versus versus most rational. I think there's, I think that's like a really intuitive way to, to think about it, but you could also, you could also think, look, I mean, isn't it more rational to do the thing that has the higher probability of getting you the outcome that you want? Right. So there could just be two different <laughs> principles about rationality. Uh, and this is something um, I know, I know it would make for, for better YouTube comment content if this were not true, but I'm, I'm going to be honest here and say that I'm, Actually, no, don't do that. <laughs> I'm actually a little Excuse bit. Excuse us, we have to confer for a minute. <laughs> a little bit conflicted. <laughs> so, uh, but when uh, basically I've spent so many, like, there's so many times that I've taught this example, and then I end up spending all my time in class trying to, like, Get the other side to see the the one side, and get the one side to see the other side. Yeah, and now uh, the result is I've just like confused myself <laughs> to some extent about like what I think, because because lots of people like just have like an adamant like it just seems mm -hmm. obvious to them that either one box or two box is the right answer, and they find it incomprehensible that anybody doesn't think that. Mm -hmm. uh, and so Jen and our uh, very frequent guest uh, for uh, for the, the movie stuff and also sometimes other things, uh, Ryan Lake. Uh, we are adamant box beers. Yeah. <coughs> Jen and Ryan. The three of us were in the car one day and we were literally shouting <laughs> at each other. <laughs> That's so embarrassing. <laughs> well, it's not embarrassing. <laughs> so... Uh, this is what goes on in our lives, peeking to our private lives. We uh, we shout in the car about Newcomb's paradox. So Ryan and Jen are both diehard single boxers about Newcomb's paradox, and I'm a little bit conflicted. But like, I I think I feel the force of you should do you should do pick both boxes 
a lot more than either of them do. So in practice, yeah. whenever we argue about this, I always end up taking the uh, the two box <laughs> side. <laughs> oh, I mean, what what is going to happen? Ninety nine point whatever percent of the time is that you take box B and the the money's in there. Now, what you want to do <laughs> is um, think of it like this. If you have two calculators, calculators are not causally intertwined in any way. But uh, if you put in a math problem into one of these calculators uh, and, the, and you, then you put it into the other one, they're going to bring about the same answer. So, <laughs> so even though they're not causally connected, you know, once you get the answer from one, you know what the answer is going to be from the other. And the predictor, how is the predictor predicting you? They're, they're following the same chain of thought that, that you're following. So when you're following the same chain of thought, then you're like the two calculators. You know, you're, you're going this way, you're going this way, we're going along these parallel paths, we're going to end up at the same place. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. I mean, I think that... That's the explanation. Thank you very much for coming. <laughs> I mean, the reason to think that you should, you should like that you should do both is that, like, there is no scenario whereby you get less money because you picked both. There is no way that could happen. The entire pie of possibility. There is no slice. <laughs> there is no slice where, as a result of uh, of picking both, uh, you you get less money. Uh, whereas there are for sure slices. Where, uh, as a result of picking both, uh, you uh, you get more money. Um, so uh, see, but I think when you do it like that, you're just leaving the predictor totally out of it. Why is the predictor even there? If uh, it's just as well, a, as if a, I, as a, there as could a, be money over here. Maybe the there's not. The but if I take the, them both, the, the, then I get an extra thousand dollars. The goal isn't to get an extra thousand dollars. The, the goal is to get as much money as you can. Yes, and you will get as much money as you can by picking both. You'll get less money, <laughs> potentially, if you only pick one. There's no scenario whereby you get less money by picking both. The predict why is the predictor there? The predictor <laughs> there is there as, as a trap for those who aren't thinking about <laughs> it carefully enough. That's what the predictor is there for. Um, yeah. <laughs> This is why we end up yelling in the car. <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't think there are any uh, studies on, on what pigeons uh, think about one box. No, or two I box. looked to see if uh, to see if pigeons had thoughts on. <laughs> they don't. Yeah, I think you could probably just cut the sentence off there. If pigeons <laughs> have thoughts, and uh, <laughs> I think the only thoughts that pigeons have is, uh, <laughs> is oh look, a little piece of food. <laughs> <laughs> and how to do the Monty Hall? <laughs> how to do the Monty? Yeah, they're they're good at that for some reason. But <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if they're good at it or if they're just better than people. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I think there are. I don't remember if it was pigeons. There's some kind of bird uh, that there's studies showing that they seem to be able to use um, disjunctive syllogisms. It's probably crows. <laughs> it's probably crows, crows do everything. <laughs> yeah. So just... crows are like the height of the bird kingdom. <laughs> Not these reticulated sparrows or whatever pontificated <laughs> finch. Anyway. Yeah. I mean the. Uh, I mean, in all seriousness, the uh, the predictor is. I mean, the predictor is is part of what makes it a hard problem because. The predictor being there means that there is this pretty plausible, you know, principle about how you should solve it. Uh, that you know, which is do the thing that has a ninety nine point nine percent chance of uh, of getting you what you want. Uh, African parrots are are pretty smart, but we can't go to Africa right now because plague. Um, <laughs> so, probably have to ask some American birds. Yeah, are Americans little out into Canada yet? Are you asking me? Yeah, I, was, I don't know. Okay. Well, no, I, I don't know. Okay, for a long time, uh, 
Yeah, for you know, for for most of the last year, uh, we weren't, which is which like is just such a bizarre thing that like it's like oh yeah, we're too plague ridden in America to visit Canada. Um, According to your dad, we don't want to go to Canada right now because they're too plague ridden. Yeah, they actually they were doing better the whole time, but then with the vaccine stage, they're actually doing worse than us. They're being way slower about the vaccines. Um, but uh, oh, thank you, Darius. Uh, so there's, there's, there's me and Darius and now it's two to two to two with you and Ryan. Uh, yes. Uh, I'm excited about that too. The, uh, so the Renegade University course, uh, uh, that's logic and politics, how to make an argument. Uh, it's going to be every Tuesday night in June or the first four anyway. Is that you? You're really pretty. Um, and, uh, then that's uh so yeah go to renegadeuniversity.com if you want to sign up for that really excited about that going to uh, do uh some like hume fact value stuff think about how normative reasoning works uh, go into uh uh some of my favorite Jews Jarvis Thompson papers do some marxism versus libertarianism stuff uh, should be an interesting mixture of students i'm actually genuinely excited about that i'm, I'm i've got uh, like this Right now, I'm, I'm in the last weeks of a class at the uh, Michael Alberts uh, School for Social and Cultural Change, and and that's been uh, and that's been really fun because, like, it's kind of liberating, uh, you know, teaching outside of a, a university because, uh, like, a regular you know university, uh, because it means that nobody's taking your class because they uh, need to you know, take off a general, general education requirement, you know, nobody's, nobody's taking it because they need some extra credits towards their major. Uh, and nobody's being graded, which is amazing, right? So the, you, you don't have to spend any time at all thinking about grades, which is what you spend a depressing amount of time in, uh, in, uh, on a university teaching. Everybody, everybody's just there because they're really excited. Shout about out to topic. auto grade, whoever created auto grade. Yeah. But then you can't do that for papers. No. And, so, um, <laughs> I think, you know, someone was saying, someone was saying that, um, there was no, no objectively correct answer. Whereas in the, hmm. the Monty Hall thing, there's a mathematically correct answer, but I think this, you know, you're right. I think this will come, what this comes down to is there's a four line box Right. of you know predictor and you so predictor predicts this and you and you do this and there are four lines there how many of those lines do you need to pay attention to um do you need to pay attention to all four or only the ones where your action and the predictor's prediction line up mm. and you know once you you've got a near infallible predictor i i don't see why you would need to pay attention to the other two lines but some people see it differently <laughs> auto grade is where you have them do um something like multiple choice or I, I guess true false matching things like that although i've never done those and the computer grades them so yeah yeah which, um yeah no that's 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 true but they uh but uh there's there's only um there's only so much you can, you know, you can do that with, you can do that with reading quizzes, but you know, papers, discussions, sure, sure. you know, uh, the smartest bird is big bird, by the way. <laughs> you've done a study of all the birds and you know, <laughs> you gave them various questions. He's very you, smart. You, you saw how they did with the Monty Hall problem. Look, and, he's <laughs> the only one that for the longest time realized that Mr. Snuffleupagus was in fact me. Alrighty then. <laughs> so yeah, I'm gonna go with Big Bird. Fair enough. Um, moving on. <laughs> so uh, so yeah, yeah, this this doesn't really have a, a dry a cut and dried answer, even though everybody that has an answer thinks theirs is the objectively correct answer. Uh, like me. Yeah, I mean, there's there's certainly no like. I mean, I think it's an interesting question whether there's any sense in which something could count as an objectively correct answer, uh, but there's certainly no, like, checkable <laughs> objectively correct answer. Uh, like, even if you think that there's some sense in which, you know, one answer is, like, objectively more rational or something like that, uh, it's it's not 
like there's there's no obvious procedure to settle it the uh, the way there is with uh, the, the way there is with everything else we've been talking about that's why they call it a paradox uh that it's because it's like taking basically two things that both seem like reasonable procedures and putting them into conflict with each other uh yeah the rational and the best bet so uh so yeah, and, and I mean, this is something, and this is something people will even use as examples when they're talking about like uh, epistemic peer disagreement, uh, which is a um, well, uh, I, I won't, I won't make Jen commit herself, but I certainly am. <laughs> so I have no trouble admitting that I'm, I'm a. Uh, I take the fifth. Uh, but um, but yeah, I think that um, the so. Sorry, it was new Oh uh, boy! Got, a, uh, uh, got, uh, got lost there. Uh, got lost there for a second. Um, but you have there's there's no um, yeah this sort of uh, this this bet best best bet procedure and this thinking through all the possibilities and and sort of extrapolating from what's true on all four lines. Uh, you know, pre- procedure. There's there's no obvious way to sort of check that against some third thing that would uh, that that would that would settle this. You know, you just have wildly conflicting intuitions. So much so that when people are talking about uh, epistemic peer disagreement, which is a philosophical problem about what uh, what to do when uh, somebody who has all the same information that you do and is just as good as you as you are at reasoning comes to a different conclusion. Um, then uh, I've, I've heard people like bring this up as an, as an example there because it's something where you have lots of people who you know nobody's like just oh they're just being dumb you know <laughs> like like people you know people who have spent tons of time thinking about it and and we don't doubt their reasoning abilities whatever will still come. That's to- why it's pure disagreement. Yeah, not I disagree with idiot on the internet. <laughs> <laughs> Although I always, I always remember there was a uh, graduate student um, where we, in our PhD program from uh, North Carolina, had a memorable accent. And I remember him saying once, you know, I have no epistemic peers. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, that sounds like something a different grad student that was there with us would say, only in a different sort of accent. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> but... Um, you don't think Big Bird yeah, has Big Bird, a bigger Big vocabulary Bird surely, than that? Come on, surely bro. knows more than a thousand words. I mean, like think about all all the lines of dialogue and all the episodes. You know, I'm, I'm sure Big Bird has a larger vocabulary than that. Uh, but uh, uh, but yeah, so so yeah. Well, the question is, what you do in an epistemic peer? Uh, Dis- what you do when an epistemic peer disagrees with you? And so one, pers- you know what you do. You get in the car and you yell about it. <laughs> That's what you do. Yeah. So the the standard non car yelling positions uh, are that uh, you like. There are people who say, "Well, you should hold steadfast." Uh, that it doesn't matter. Uh, it's it's irrelevant. That you know that it's it, this doesn't count as a kind of evidence that you're wrong. And then there are people with the conciliatory position. They say, "No, this does count as at least some evidence that you're wrong. This doesn't necessarily mean." You have to change your mind, or, or or that you are wrong, right? But it's some evidence that you're it wrong. Is, yeah, uh, and one way of getting at the intuition that uh, that this does count as some evidence that you're wrong is like I was thinking about this with your calculators example earlier. You you think about uh, like you punch the same problem into two calculators, and you know it's it's the same person putting them in into both. Uh, and they're, they've done it a bunch of times. They've been super careful, make sure they're not making any mistakes and punching it in. And one calculator shows a different result than the other calculator. So you think, okay, at least one of these calculators is not working properly. Uh, but it would be really weird if like, it was your, your calculator and your friend's calculator to say, well, I'm sure that my calculator is the one that's working properly because it's mine. Like that is like, that doesn't, why, why would that be a reason? No. And they think, well, okay, now now just substitute your brain for your calculator and it's the same problem. Uh, and that would be the sort of thing that motivates people to say, yeah, this definitely counts as some evidence that you're wrong, like mm-hmm. some reason to think that you're missing something. So it, it doesn't necessarily, 
like the really extreme version of this position says that whenever an epistemic peer disagrees with you, you should just suspend judgment, like no longer have the position, just be agnostic about who's right. Uh, but I would also like for everyone to know that Lucy is making an olfactory appearance on today's <laughs> Wow. Show. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Woo. Uh, fair enough. Um, well, that's totally fair, but I think the question was the uh, was which is the smartest bird? <laughs> what is Big Bird? What kind of bird is he? I don't know. I wonder if Kathy's still watching. Uh, Kathy, what kind of bird is Big Bird? <laughs> um, if there is a right answer, this is the procedure for finding it out. <laughs> she knows a lot about birds. She does. She knows more about birds than anybody we know. So she is the person. As she has no epistemic peer <laughs> when it comes to birds. Exactly. Uh, but the idea is that this is this at least like if you were seventy five percent sure. Uh, that uh, that your answer was right, and then you find out that your epistemic peer disagrees. Maybe that should bring it down to like seventy three point eight or something, uh, because or depending on how many of your epistemic peers disagree with you. If epistemic peers are disagreeing left and right, then like then that is like, that like really gives you some reason to think. Uh, ah, she <laughs> says a very a very large canary. Uh, so, <laughs> fair enough. I think probably an unusually large canary. Uh, <laughs> so, no, not an ostrich chicken mix. No. <laughs> but a very, a very large canary. I don't even want to think about how that would come to be. <laughs> For all math and bird problems, uh, Kathy. Um. So, think. All right, if, if epistemic peers are disagreeing with you all over the place, then that might give you at least uh, some reason to think that. Uh, yeah. Maybe I'm maybe I'm the one who's missing something here. You know, like I, I should go back to the drawing board. Uh, one thing that complicates that in practice is you know trying to figure out who's actually uh, counts as an epistemic peer, and then uh, and then there's also I think one reason definitely probably that some philosophers don't like that is that I think well hold on if uh, if uh, if this undermined your your com your reason for believing whatever you believe every time an epistemic peer disagreed, then man, good luck doing philosophy. Since every single issue in philosophy, <laughs> you're going to have epistemic <laughs> peers disagreeing with you all over the Gotta place. Grab hold and <laughs> hang on. <laughs> yeah. Hang on for dear life. At least, at least, or at least make people give you their argument. Don't just say, oh, no, I'm not. give them an argument. You know, I'm pretty. You know, yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm, you know. I know a lot about this stuff, and I don't think so. You know, that, that's not good enough. They need oh, to, okay. <laughs> that they need to give you, you don't say. They don't. They need to give you a uh, an actual argument. Um, there is actually also so the usual thing is just about epistemic peers. Uh, Joshua Blanchard, who's somebody who um, interacts uh, with me a lot on uh, on Twitter and I see and I actually interviewed his brother once uh, about an article that his brother Benjamin Blanchard had written for uh, Current Affairs uh, but Joshua Blanchard is a philosophy professor and and he has a paper uh, that's sort of the other way around for the epistemic peer issue which is about epistemic bad company you know so the paper is about whether you should <laughs> It should make you less confident if you find out that people who uh, who are really prone towards bad reasoning, you know, are coming to uh, the same conclusions than uh, than you are. So, what does it mean that we have different views on the uh, the boxes? I don't know. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think it, I think it probably justifies me in being a little bit conflicted. Is what is what that means, <laughs> and it also justifies me in being certain. <laughs> <laughs> oh, fair enough. <laughs> yep. Uh, so, in any case, um, I think that is probably uh, as uh, as good a time as uh, as ever to uh, to leave it off uh, for uh, for this week. Um, we uh, we will be doing this next week, although uh, it's going to be in two different. Uh, in uh, in split screen format. It's a very sad way to do it. Uh, I am in going to 
uh, be in California to uh, to visit my uh, my younger brother, and uh, I will still be here. And um, and so they're off. They're going to be off doing boy stuff before David gets married. So his last last free last. last well, he's not getting married until August, so yeah. he'll, he'll still have some. He still has some time of freedom left. It's fine. <laughs> I don't think he sees it that way. Uh, uh, but but yeah, they're gonna have one last brother freedom before they both get uh, the old ball and chain attached. That is most definitely not the way either of us would say that. <laughs> but uh, in any case, uh, I'm gonna go see see Dave and also uh, see. Uh, uh see daniel bestner and uh, megan dairy while, while i'm there so uh so that's that's fun um probably in the last day that uh that i'll that'll be there uh but i'll be here in the backwoods of michigan still <laughs> with the dog and the cat fair enough uh but uh but meanwhile and there will not be this background because this is not my preferred background there will be a different background fair enough yeah, no kitty appearance this this week. He uh, he hasn't had anything to say. I guess he's uh, he's not adamant, you know, about the uh, Monty uh, Monty Hall problem or Newcomb's paradox or anything like not. that. Um, but he's a cat. The more boxes, the better. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> he would definitely be a two boxer. Uh, so. He doesn't care about the money. He just wants the boxes. Right. Uh, it's like when you buy them stuff, they don't want the stuff. They want the box. The box that came in, yeah, yeah for sure. Uh, so yeah, I guess just uh, just quick plugs uh, before we go. On Sunday, um, for the Sunday night debate breakdown, uh, Matt McManus and Russell Sabrigley are going to be joining me again, and because we are doing part three of the uh, Zizek Peterson breakdown. With any luck, how many parts are there going to be? Uh, three, I hope. <laughs> I, I, I am counting on the idea that this is the uh, this is the evening that we're gonna we're gonna wrap it up uh, on uh, on Sunday. Um, on uh, on Monday, uh, we're gonna have for the regular episode. We have Juliana Ferrano from uh, from Act uh, Act TV. Uh, <laughs> Also, uh, Nora Farrow Bellows. I hope I'm getting that right uh, from the Electronic Intifada. Uh, so uh, that is uh, that is going to be good on Wednesday this week. There is no uh, movie stream uh, because I am debating uh, Michael Humer at that time uh, about whether taxation is theft. Uh, and uh, but we will be doing a stream here. I'll I'll jump on at seven thirty. Uh, there are a few things we want to do before the debate and then turn it over to our producer, Forrest, and he'll watch the debate on this channel, share it, and uh, and then I'll come on to do a little post-game analysis uh, at the end. So all good stuff coming up. Uh, and um, Everything with Ben is good stuff. Thank you. <laughs> Even if you find my my, my two-boxer tendencies <laughs> totally uncompelling. Exactly. Uh, so... Uh, <laughs> So those those should uh, those should all be uh, those should all be really good. Uh, should oh I should also say uh, so I'm you know starting to uh, to figure out more stuff to uh, to promote the uh, the new book. Going to be talking to the Florida International University YDSA at the uh, at the end of the month. Uh, the YMCA. <laughs> You know, no, but you could do. Uh, but it, you know, I, I guess I'm, I'm sure somebody somewhere has, has has done a parody version of the song. You know, Y D S A. Uh, so uh, so that should be uh, that should be good. Uh, and that's uh, that's going to be a virtual event. But I'm I'm going to do. Uh, but I I am starting to gear up and think about uh, in person uh, book stuff as uh, as more places open up uh, as people uh, as people get vaccinated. So. Um, you know, if, if you want to host such a thing, uh, do, uh, you know, do reach out. Uh, but uh, meanwhile, you might even get a bonus appearance from me. I know, right? Crazy. So, <laughs> <laughs> all right. Uh, Catch us in the parking lot yelling about uh, <laughs> one box and two boxes. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, that just that just makes us sound mentally ill. You know, just like yelling <laughs> in the parking lot about the number of boxes. <laughs> we majored in philosophy. There's got to be something wrong with us. Fair enough. Um, well, I was a double major in philosophy and history. So I had philosophy in English. So there you go. So yeah. we're not, not entirely insane. 
there you go. But in any case, uh, so I'll see everybody then. Uh, thank you all uh, for uh, for watching. Left is best. Team Snoopy forever. <laughs>